before this week's podcast, I would like to thank anyone who's donated to my Patreon account. It means a lot, and even a small amount of one year a month goes a long way. If anyone is interested in donating, there is a link on the Rounds Around Facebook page, my Twitter page, and also under all the podcast episodes on SoundCloud. Thank you, and enjoy this podcast. Welcome to episode 23 of Rallon's Rant, and I'm joined by Damien Hughes. Damien is the founder of Liquid Thinker and has also written several best-selling books, including his latest, which is called The Barcelona Way, Unlocking the DNA of a Winning Culture. Damien is also a change management consultant and sports psychologist who has worked for teams such as Sales Sharks, Warrington Wolves, West Brom, and the Scottish rugby team. Now, with the introduction over with... How are you today, Damien? And thanks a million for coming on for having a chat. Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Richie. And it's a real pleasure to be here and to chat with you. So thank you for the invitation. No worries at all. Well, the first thing I'd like to do is to congratulate you on your latest book. I, I finished reading this last week and I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, thank you. Especially the, the many insights into what life was like as a player or even as Pep Guardiola during that period of dominance for Barcelona and and how has the reaction been there so far to the release? Yeah, it's been really humbling. Uh, I think a lot of people have, uh, have, have given feedback on it uh, that have said that uh, they've enjoyed it. So it's not necessarily a football book. It's a book about uh, culture and it's about how do you create a high-performing culture. And what I like is I think it's sort of, brought that topic of conversation um, or or that area to become a topic of conversation. You know, I think that, say, the events at Manchester United um, have brought it into sharper focus or you look at what Liverpool are doing. There's questions now that people are starting to recognise that culture is an important part of any organisation and starting to recognise how to harness it. And I'd like to feel that the book has, has helped people have a more informed discussion around that. And and for anyone yet to read it, so anyone listening who hasn't read the book yet, the start of it immediately gets you hooked in. So there's a story to begin with, and it's it's a story of Pep watching his bench yeah. after Barcelona had almost scored and created a chance. And the players who showed no emotion because they're more or less were concerned about themselves and not the team's general success. Were, more, were turfed out of the club eventually within the next few months. But when I was reading that, it got me thinking immediately. It was basically, you wrote about Guardiola trying to change some of these players yeah. and their views, but but ultimately he couldn't, which led them to being sold. Yeah. So the question I immediately wanted to ask you, if I ever got the chance to, was should the manager not take some of the blame for not being able to create a culture in which all the players feel comfortable rather than 80%, 90%? Uh, it's, it's a brilliant question, Richard. I think I think what what a culture really can do is it can. So, so the research says that when we talk about culture, what we're, so when we talk about a good culture, what we're effectively talking about is what is what's termed instead a commitment culture. And a commitment culture is a culture that's driven by a really clear sense of purpose, but equally by some really clear behavior uh, behaviors. So, what a manager can do is articulate what those behaviours are. And then if you look at the etymology of the word commitment, commitment implies there's a level of choice there from everybody. So I think what you can do is give everybody that choice to say, this is what we're going to stand for, this is what we're going to measure you against, and then ultimately you don't control anybody, but you give everybody the ability to then choose to say, that sounds like my kind of environment or not. So at Barcelona, what they did was, they went back, so after the success of the Champions League in 2006, the next two years were a relative disaster for them. So they finished 18 points behind Real Madrid. They had to give them a guard of honour coming onto the field and things like that. So there was lots of things that added to the humiliation of their underperformance. And they went back and said, when we've been good in our history, 
What was the behaviors that have been consistently present? And they identified three. The first one was humility. So we don't come here lauding it or showing off our wealth, our privilege, our status. We act with humility. The second one is we work hard, so we're grafters. And then the third one is we put the team above our own self-interest. So I think what a manager can do is to be really clear and explicit and say, this is what you're going to be judged against, not only your talent, because there's a lovely quote that Cheeky Bagheerestain, the director of football, gave me when I interviewed him on this. He said, your talent will get you as far as the dressing room door. Your behaviour decides if we'll keep you in there or not. So when people say, oh, is this not just about talented players? You go, yeah, of course it is. But that's only the first prerequisite. Then it's about behaviours, and that's where I think a manager can really make a difference by being really clear and explicit to say, this is what I will judge you against. And then, to go back to that phrase, commitment culture, everybody has a choice there. You either choose that you want to be a part of that and you're going to accept the judgments that are going to be applied, or you choose not to be, but you have a choice to do that or not. And so I don't think a manager has a responsibility to try and make everybody uh, uh, or, or to get everybody to fit into it. I think he has a choice to give everyone the choice as to whether they want to fit into it or not. Mm. No, that is that is a fair point and it's an interesting one. And you were talking there in the introduction about the latest updates with Manchester United and with regards to the culture and with regards to players and management, just, I'm just going to read you out a quote, what Gary Neville was saying uh, yesterday with regards to what he thought Manchester United had gone away from. So he went on to say that, and to quote him, no one should ever be allowed to enter Manchester United's training ground or Old Trafford ever again to shape their own philosophy. That is done. Manchester United's philosophy is so steep and so meaningful. It's like Barcelona's and it's like Ajax. At, Bar- at Ma- Manchester United, you play fast, attacking football in an entertaining way. You bring young players through and give them belief and you win. To be honest with you, the third one sometimes goes in cycles. The winning actually comes as a result as of doing the first two rights. The third one doesn't always happen. So here, it seems that Neville suggests that David Moyes, Lou Van Hal, Jose Mourinho drifted away from the core principles of the club and therefore didn't get the success the club ultimately wanted. So so would you agree yeah. that's that's one of the main reasons where these managers went wrong? By excessive under fun. Yeah, massively. So I think that I think Manchester United is interesting that it was it so it was built on um, on a commitment culture. So you look at when uh, Matt Busby came in, one of his famous things that there's a famous quote from Busby that said, you know, uh, that he told the players, and I think he told them this like it was the 48 Cup final team or maybe it was the emergence of the Busby Babes, but he said, people that come to watch Manchester United do hard, tough jobs and they come here to be entertained and it's our duty to do that. So you listen to any of the players that used to play there in the six days, they said Busby's final advice um, whenever they left the dressing room was go and enjoy it. Go and enjoy it and go and express yourself. Now, there's no coincidence that Johan Cruyff, when Barcelona's dream team in 1992 beat Sampdoria at Wembley to win their first ever European Cup, the advice he gave the players was exactly the same. Just go and enjoy it now. Because the viewers, you're still here to entertain people. So, so, it, so you can win and be entertaining. And that's almost inculcated in Manchester United's DNA. Now, when they've gone away from that, there's no coincidence that they seem to have underperformed. Now, I think Manchester United, like Barcelona, were built on humility, hard work and team first. I think the Manchester United behaviours are not too dissimilar to what Neville was saying there. I think there's three, again. I think the first one is this idea of relentlessness. So there's a famous quote that Steve McLaren adapted it from uh, from an, an American football coach. I think it was Vince Lombardi. But Ferguson used to repeat it um, relent- uh, quite literally, relentlessly. He used to say, Manchester United never get beat. We occasionally run out of time, but we never get beat. Yeah, no, so it's that idea of we'll keep coming after you. We will be relentless in terms of we play fast just and, we, and if we get our foot on your throat, we'll keep coming at you. The second behaviour they have is courage. The idea to 
to, to, to again, one of Ferguson's famous quotes is, I'm not interested in the player that demands the ball when we 2 0 up at home. I want the guy that's demanding the ball when we're getting beat 1 0 and there's a minute to go. So he says it's not just physical courage, it's moral courage to stand up and, 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 and keep doing the right things. And then the third thing that they have is this idea that they play to win, not play to, not play not to lose. So this idea that they're gamblers, they will constantly, they will, and it relates to that idea that of the relentlessness and the courage they'll keep coming after you. So I think that those three behaviours embody the very culture at Manchester United. And you think about somebody like David Moyes uh, when he came in, Michael Carrick's on their father saying, David Moyes said to them, the way I'm going to get you to, be, uh, to get better is I'm going to get you to run more. So it wasn't about winning, it was about uh, running more. Van Hals was very much a, an approach of... Um, you play not to lose. So this idea of, of, of this slow, methodical build-up isn't what United are about. It's about that relentlessness. And then you look at Mourinho coming in. Mourinho is a great example of, of... There's five different types of culture that can emerge. And I think Mourinho's appointment is a textbook example of where of, of, of how cultures can be dysfunctional. So mm. one of the types of cultures that you can have is an autocratic culture. And this is where it's driven by one powerful individual. You can also have a bureaucratic culture, which is almost like management by committee. And then you've got what we describe here as this commitment culture. And I think what you saw with Mourinho's appointment was you had an autocrat coming in, but then trying to fight for supremacy with a bureaucratic board that were deciding whether they were going to give him the money to buy players. But then they also had a star culture which is one of the fourth type of cultures where they will, where you bring in really expensive, highly remunerated players and you put them on a pedestal. So the recruitment of Pogba and Sanchez fitted that model. So you've basically got three different types of cultures fighting for supremacy and a commitment culture that adherence to those behaviours just went out of the window, which is why I think you've seen the underperformance that's been so stark over the last couple of years. Well, it is, it is, it is something that I probably took for granted, which was the fact there was actually several con- cultures evident under Mourinho, and it it kind of came to the fore, I guess, especially with him and Pogba and one or two other uh, members of staff in it. And the interesting thing that I always thought looking at Mourinho's team was, and you, you write about this extensively in your book, is just the lack of leaders, the lack of, as you like to term them, the cultural architects within the the club yep. and the guys who you'd expect would be behind Mourinho i.e. your Paul Pogba's your Sanchez your big name players your big big characters they were more or less doing the opposite whether they were publicly speaking about their the unhappiness in the camp or the unhappiness individually at their treatment and you look immediately of how it's been flipped once uh, old Onigoli Solskjaer has come in he's changed a few little things like I just read recently there they now have to wear the the club's blazers to games rather than coming in in whatever uniforms they like. They now stay in a hotel much closer to Old Trafford because remember under Mourinho those yeah, three or four times like, where it just yeah, turned sloppy, up late. Didn't it? it did. It did ultimately look sloppy, but that's one thing that I I firmly notice now with the United team. There's like Paul Pogba now looks like the Paul Paul bag. Paul Pogba, everyone knows from the World Cup, the big, world-class, dominant midfielder who leads by example, but then also you can tell he he seems to be more of a leader within the squad and people look to him a bit more while a few months ago that wasn't the case. So, like, was that a part of Mourinho's downfall as well where there wasn't a clear sense of a core group of individuals like you could compare to, say... Manchester United 15 years ago, you always had your Roy Keynes, Rio Ferdinand, Paul Scholes, Ryan Giggs, etc. Yeah, very much. It's, it, 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 it's really a stupid point that you're making there, Richie, because this idea of a cultural architect, what I talk about is these are your leaders without title. These are the guys that carry the weight of addressing them. Now, a cultural architect will emerge via two criteria. So in addressing them, you will always get a hierarchy, and your cultural architects are the guys at the top of this. Now, they'll emerge via two criteria, social or technical. So they're either the best players that everyone looks up to, or socially they're charismatic and gregarious enough 
that everyone listens to. Now, in some instances, you get some that are both, but they are there. Now, your point about previous Manchester United teams, the likes of Keane, Neville, himself, Scholes, Giggs, um, characters like that, is that they ran the dressing room for you. So one of Ferguson's great, uh, great messages was that by the time an issue got to him, it was probably too late for the player concerned. So if you hadn't been able to heed the advice of Ryan Giggs or Paul Scholes when they were telling you to wind your neck in, by the time it got to Ferguson, it was probably too late that you weren't really going to learn the lesson or your credibility had already been damaged. So there's some great stories that, that, uh, that emanate from that period. So I remember hearing Roy Keane talk about Cristiano Ronaldo and uh, he was talking about what did he feel about him sort of admiring himself in, uh, in the mirror for a long period after training. And Keane's point was, I had no problem with it because he'd already been in training an hour before everyone else anyway. So he'd come and done extra work. So if he wanted to use his downtime to admire himself, that wasn't a problem. Where he did seem to have a problem was players that, that, that so I was told a great story many years ago about when Kira Richardson uh, turned up for training one day in a Bentley, convertible Bentley with the top down and music blaring out. And he bumped into Keane in the car park and Keane told him to turn his car around and go home. He said, you're not welcome here. Because, you, because you've been more concerned about the drive in and being noticed on the drive in than you have been focusing on what you're going to learn today in training. So there's a distinction there between somebody that's doing it and not investing the hard work and behaving in the way that you want versus somebody that is still adopting those same behaviours, but actually it's he's doing that and doing the extra work as well. So those kind of characters, when you're dressing them for you, there's another lovely story about that Roy Keane tells about uh, back in the early 90s when the players had a had a, a players pool uh, for some video that they'd done and the squad were going to receive like 500 quid each and they decided that rather than do that they'd put it all in a pot and whoever uh, got their name drawn out of the hat would receive like £16,000 and the young players like Scholes and Butt and Neville and Beckham they were given the option not to put that at, put, uh, put it in because at the time as young players it was deemed that 500 quid was a lot was very significant for them but two of the players Scholes and Nicky mm-hmm. Butt decided that they wouldn't have the chance of winning the bigger pot so they put their money in now the winner of the draw was Cantona and he received the £16,000 what I love about the story is that the next day Cantona turned up with two cheques for £8,000 each and gave them to Scholes and Butt and the reason he did it was he said, you dare to try to win. So that deserves reward. But if you go back to that idea of what I said, United have been built on, that this is a team that plays to win, not plays not to lose. What Cantona was doing was reinforcing that message in quite a symbolic manner. So that's where your cultural architects become really key figures. And I think what you saw with Mourinho was that he didn't seem to invest a lot in the relationships of these key architects so there seems to be some t- like the example earlier this season where he waited till the tv cameras were at training so he could have a crack at paul pogba for something that he'd done that just undermines those relationships mm. in the dressing room because you're removing any sense of there's two things that have to be there psychological safety and trust and if somebody feels that you're they're going to betray that trust by speaking publicly about you or they're going to wait to have a crack at you when there's a, an audience um, outside the dressing room watching you. Psychological safety and trust are not there, which means that you start... So when people use that term, you lose the dressing room. What they're saying is you lose trust and psychological safety. I suppose Sir Alex, he, he created one of the most powerful and trustworthy dressing rooms in recent times with regards to football or any professional sport and he always coined the term no one's as big as the club and I've even heard you mention that towards the end of his time he was saying no one's as big as the manager and he always stuck to that but to to kind of to to flip it a bit and show the not so good side of it was and we briefly discussed it there with Pep Guardiola when he first came into Barcelona in the book you write about Ronaldinho, Deco and 
Eto'o being more or less the the cultural architects of that Frank Rijkaard Barcelona. And they were successful in their own right, winning the Champions League in the mid-2000s. And after the World Cup, Ronaldinho mentally checked out, some would say. During that period, you had Messi kind of going off the rails. He was involved in a few things off the pitch, like car crashes and whatnot. And then in, a, in another talk, you also pointed out that 10 out of the 23 guys in the Barcelona squad got separated or divorced from their partners during that time, which shows that there was somewhat of an outside influence of the poor behaviours being shown to them on a day-to-day uh, point of view. But what I'd like to ask is when cultural architects in this case go off off track or start setting poor examples, is that is that their fault considering they obviously displayed characteristics that Barcelona were proud of or is this Frank Rijkaard's fault for not staying on top of it? A bit of both. Like most of these things, it's, it's probably a bit more subtle than just uh, uh, the one simple answer. But the example of Barcelona is a really good one because because what so their cultural assets in that dressing room at the time were three of their big players, like you say, Ronaldinho, Deco and Eto'o. Unfortunately, those three guys hated each other. So there was lots of public sniping, similar to what we're talking about we've seen at Manchester United. Eto was giving comments where he was describing Frank Rijkaard as a very bad man because he was allowing Ronaldinho to get away with, I mean, the stories of him turning up direct to training from nightclubs and the masseurs and the kit yeah. men sort of protecting him and making excuses for him. And you're right about some of the dysfunction that was going on not just on the field, but off it, like the amount of divorces and separations that took place in that 18 month period. I mean, 10 out of 23 players in the squad is, 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 is enough to sort of make you start to think what's happening. Like say, the impact of Messi and the next generation, they were being exposed to this and they were learning some key lessons. Um, and it needed to be re-emphasized. These are lessons that you don't adopt rather than what you do. So, one of Guardiola's first demands was that those three guys were removed from the club for him before he took over. So, um, in the case of Eto, he changed his mind for a year. And that came because when Eto came back uh, training after Guardiola's first season, he was ahead on all the training stats. So, he came back and trained like a demon. And what happened was the players in the dressing room, your likes of Iniesta and Puyol and Valdez, came to Guardiola and said, this guy deserves a second chance because he's demonstrated some, some level of, um, of, of, of humility to come back and do something different, which is part of the reason that they gave him that second chance of, of, of staying on for an extra year. So that gives you an idea of just how powerful these characters can be, both for good and bad. I think... I mean, some of it comes down to a sense of identity. So when we make decisions, there's two criteria that we all make when it comes to decision-making. Now, you'll get different arguments. Psychologists and and behavioural economists uh, will argue that uh, their case for one or the other, but the reality is it's probably a bit of both. So sometimes when it comes to making a decision, you make a decision based on cost versus benefit. You say, what's this worth? What's it going to cost me? And then you do a a rational analysis. Is it worth my time? The other way you make a decision is you do things through um, identity. And when you do things through identity, you effectively ask yourself three questions at an unconscious level. You say, who am I? What sort of person am I? What's the situation that I'm facing? Now, what would somebody like me do in this particular situation? So to illustrate the point, I, I so... And I think you use this in the book. I talk about the example of Paul McCartney. You say, if you look at Paul McCartney, he seems to answer most of his questions through a sense of identity. So he, so he identifies as a musician that just happened to once be in a band called the Beatles. So if you look at his decision-making criteria in the 50 years since the Beatles split up, this is a guy that's gone and recorded with a variety of different artists. He's gone into a variety of different genres like classical music as well as pop and rock. He's still performing now in his 70s. He's producing numerous albums because he identifies as a musician. Now, if he identi- now if he came at it from the point of view of he's a member of the Beatles, 
he'll have spent the last 50 years just milking his legacy of what he did in the 60s. So it shows you in terms of decisions that are being made. And what Barcelona went down the route of is we want cultural architects that identify with the values and the behaviours of the club, which is why it's no coincidence that a lot of the La Masia, the youth academy uh, players, ended up becoming such influential characters because they'd already been inculcated with the behaviours of humility, hard work and team first. So one of the quotes that Guardiola gave was when he was explaining uh, why he promoted Pedro and Busquets from the, uh, from the B team to come in with him to be part of the first team setup was that they didn't have sleeve tattoos, silly haircuts or earrings. And his rationale behind it was what that indicated to him was they came from a sense of identity. They didn't want to stand out in the crowd. They wanted to fit in. They weren't looking to, to be noticed. So he was looking for people that had that sense of identity, but then they could run the dressing room for him. So it's all kinds of stories that come out of that period that, that like some of it is public, some of it is private, but my, I, I use a couple of examples to illustrate it. Like there's a time in when Thiago, so he's come up from, from La Masia and he scores his first ever goal for the club against the Real Numancia. And it's the fifth goal of a 7-0 victory. Mm-hmm. But when he scores a goal, he runs over and him and Danny Alves start doing the samba dance to celebrate. And everybody stood around laughing. <laughs> and so Puyo turns up and Puyo runs over and clips them both out around the air, stops the dance and sends them back to the halfway line to restart the game. And after the game, Puyo comes out and issues an apology to the Real Numancia players. He said, I'm sorry we behaved like that. He said, we wanted to beat you and we wanted to score as many as we could but we weren't trying to humiliate you. We understand you're good professionals and that wasn't what we do. Because, again, it's just a really simple way of illustrating how humility is key. You know, when they win the treble, the first thing that uh, Puyo does is he invites Danny Abidal, uh, uh, Eric Abidal to come up and lift the trophy. Now, this is a guy that's had liver cancer and required a transplant. But if you've got a culture where you put the team above your own self-interest, that's exactly what you would do. It's not a gimmick. It becomes a real powerful statement of reinforcing. This is the way that we do things around there. And that, that ultimately is, it's if you see these traditionally successful clubs across all sports, they always tend to have those kind of key characteristics of academy players are involved in the squad you always have some sort of management manager or assistant manager who knows the ethos of the club inside out and a good example probably would be the Leicester Tigers under Richard Cockerell they had a sustained period of success they had your Martin Johnsons your Martin Carriers etc and then they went away from that and then they had to kind of refine and rediscover their identity and ultimately have landed back with Jordan Murphy who is a similar mold to Richard Cockerell, who's been there for 10, 15 plus years, and they're probably hoping to. Exactly, a really good, a really good appointment in going back to the way that we do things. That I use a phrase with uh, teams when I work with them, Mitzi, where I talk about this idea of success leaves clues. Mm. So when you're successful, why are you successful? What is it that 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 drives your success? And the answer to that will often start at a behavioural level. Now, if you can't tell me why you're successful, how do you know how to fix it when things go wrong? So the ability to articulate your success is key. And you look at Leicester Tigers and Jordan uh, and his appointment there. This is a guy that understands it's about teamwork, hard work, humility, and all the things that we've been speaking about of successful teams. He understands it because he's lived it, he's been a part of it. So I've no doubt that if he's given the resources and the time, he'll bring success back to an environment like that. And while we're on the topic of of rugby teams, you've done you've done extensive work with several professional teams, whether it's rugby league or rugby league, uh, union, I should say. And I remember reading last year in the Six Nations during um just after shortly after the Welsh game with Scotland, you you helped out a few a few of the few of the players, if I'm not mistaken. And like what sort of things do you find yourself do and are being forced to do when you basically offer your services to a professional sport and in this case the Scottish rugby team 
Well, I've been really lucky. So when Gregor Townsend took over as the coach, he asked me if I would if I would come on board with him and his team to support them. So I've been I've I've felt really privileged that I've been doing that for the uh, uh, last eighteen months effectively. So I started on the summer tour in twenty seventeen. Um, the way I prefer to work is that um, I like working with the coaches. Uh, because they're the guys with the real credibility. So it's almost like, a, as a, you know, if it doesn't sound too grand, it's almost like to help coach the coaches. So the way I say it is, if I was to stand up in front of a group of players and deliver a message, maybe 70 to 80% of them would buy into the message and would do it. But you'd have a resistance from about 20% because they'd be saying, who are you? What do you know? Why should I listen to you? But if the head coach stands up and delivers exactly the same message, 95% of the people will buy into it just because he picks the team. He's the one that carries the real power. So if you can remove your ego yeah. from the equation, it's not about who delivers the message. It's about whether the idea gets into the blood supply of the organization quickly. So I prefer to work with the coaches because I feel that that way, if you can debate and decide on what's the message that's going to be communicated and you can support them in delivering it in the most effective way that then translates into performance that's really what gets interested so um the scotland example has been has been really rewarding in that regard because not only gregor but the coaches that he has with him he's got matt taylor he's got a guy called dan mcfarlane that's now a holster but danny wilson that came in to replace him these are guys that are really uh open to looking at different ways so the easiest way of explaining it is that these guys are, so I have nothing to do with sort of the technical output in terms of how, how a team will play or anything like that. So that's not my role and I, mm. I would have no part to play in those discussions. My job is often around the soft, the softer side of things. So if, so if you do the hard skills and stuff like how they perform in the gym, speed, fitness, passing techniques and things like that, my job is about creating the culture and making sure that mentally, we're in a pretty robust place. So it often gets back to the soft skills, but the reality is they often open the door to the harder stuff anyway. And that's where I would sit in the discussions and and, uh, and maybe share some ideas with them. And it's interesting you get the buzzword soft skills. And I did a podcast recently with uh, Alan Stein Jr., an American guy who speaks about leadership, and he just recently wrote a book. And he was saying how important soft skills are now in business or even in sport that traditionally 10 20 years ago especially say in business those people were looking more so for people with higher iqs and the brains and the great the great um college degrees well now more so they're looking for emotional intelligence and the soft skills that you mentioned there as well so like with regards to say a sporting context is it very important that these players and especially in the current generation that gets much criticized is it very important that they have strong emotional intelligence as opposed to just being really smart intelligent players if that makes yeah, sense Yeah, definitely it's a great question and i'd say soft skills is a bit of an unfair title to give it i know i've just used it but i often say soft skills um betrays the fact that that's your entry in to then do the hard the hard stuff that the example i use the best way of illustrating it is that remember many years ago, I, I did a biography of a book called Thomas Holmes, the, the, the five weight world champion. And in the course of doing that, I went out to Detroit, uh, the boxing, uh, to visit his boxing gym out there. And it was a hugely intimidating environment. You know, this was, I was in the poorest part of America's poorest city. Um, I was going into some pretty dark places where violence was rife and, and, I make no bones about it. It was intimidating, but I met Manny Stewart, who was the head coach in this environment. This is a guy that had produced 30 world champions in a 25-year career. And when I got to meet him, he used a brilliant phrase. He said, I work on the basis that you need to contain and then explain. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I've got a million pounds worth of advice I can give you to help you get better. But if you don't trust me, if, you don't, if we don't enjoy each other's company, if you don't feel that I care about you, if you don't feel that I understand a little bit of your story and your background, 
why would you ever listen to me to then take that advice from me? So he said, that it's this idea of I need to invest in what we might be, what we might term soft skills before I can give you the hard skills of getting better. So when you go into any sporting environment and ask people, divide up your performance, especially in team sports, and say hard versus soft skills, how much of your success is down to being able to run hard and fast and pass a ball and lift weights, and how much of it is down to confidence or down to communication or down to resilience? I've yet to meet an elite team that will tell you it's not 70-30 in favour of the of those softer skills. So the obvious follow-up question is, where do you spend most of your time? And the irony is, most people spend most time dealing with the hard stuff, and then we almost put the soft skills on the back burner. So I work with, so I, I often resist doing this when I work on teams. I say, oh, can you come in in pre-season and do a session? And I say, not really, because if you're not going to sustain it through the season, if you're going to do one or two sessions in pre-season just because you've got the time to talk about culture, but you're never going to go back and revisit it again, don't waste your time doing it. So it's this idea that it needs to be something that's that's higher up our our, our agenda to make sure that you then create an environment where people can go and flourish and perform and give the very best version of who they are. With I, I kind of said it slightly in the question, and ultimately it's all about creating cultures to get the best performance possible, and it doesn't always exactly mean there's guaranteed success in it, but with with current state of professional sports and society in general the the term snowflake generation has been tossed about quite a bit whether that's in sport politics or even business so do you think in present day do you think management styles have been forced to change and demand less in order to take away some of the accountability from their staff or players who are part of this generation because i'd say if you're kind of comparing current say footballers for instance compared to what they were 15 20 years ago it seems that the power players seem to have now is far greater than what it used to be 15 yeah, 20 years ago. Yeah, I, I mean, it, I, I, I find it fascinating. Like, I'll give you an example from, I was away on tour with the team um, last summer where I walked into the room and I saw these athletes all crowded around the TV screen and everyone was sort of absolutely absorbed with what was going on. And then when I got closer and understood what it was, it was Love Island. Now, initially my instinct was what are you doing watching this and then actually when you step back you go you know what love island yeah. isn't aimed at me it's not aimed at my generation with all due respect to myself so my instinct was how can they be watching things like this and then when you step back and go you know what you've got a communal experience here you've got all these players sat in a room enjoying each other's company just watching some light entertainment on the tv and you go that's no different from my generation or the generation before. It, like What you're watching is different, but the experience of wanting to come together and really enjoy each other's company is actually the sign of a really healthy culture. So I'm often really reluctant or challenge people to say, just be careful about saying things have changed, things are different. It's not how it used to be because the reality is we haven't evolved that quickly as a species. We've been conditioned differently and I accept that can change. But the reality is, we still have, we still want to belong to a group. We still want to feel safe and valued when we're in there. We want to have some degree of autonomy and choice and control. Those factors are common across the generations. And I think that when we look back at coaches that have been successful in, in previous generations, those same principles about how you treat people with a degree of decency, you give them some level of autonomy, he's still there. So, I, like, I know we've cited him a few times, but Ferguson's a, like, quite an illuminating example of this, that people will say to you, oh, yeah, but you used the hairdryer and he was a bit of a tyrant. And you go, where's your image of that from? And the reality is, we've got what I've heard in the media. And you go, yeah, I'm sure you have, but do you believe everything the media tells you? And the reality was, was he capable of losing his temper and being a tyrant? Definitely. Did it happen week after week after week? Definitely not. You listen to any of the players that played for him, they'll tell you it did happen, but it was once in a blue moon kind of stuff. It wasn't every week. It wasn't relentless. 
it was that idea of building trust. I, I, I spoke recently to uh, Chris Casper, who's the director of football at Salford City with Kevin Neville and things like that. And he used a lovely phrase when we we're talking. He just said, I just didn't want to let him down. So it wasn't that he was shouting at me. He said, he never, he, I very rarely got the hairdryer off him. I just didn't want to let him down. Sometimes it was a look when I knew that I'd done something that disappointed him, that made sure I never did it again. Now, but that story doesn't dominate the headlines. That story isn't sexy enough to want to report that he treated people with a level of respect and decency. What we love hearing about is him smashing teacups and things like that. So there's a narrative that we look back with those tinted glasses and assume that that was what all the coaches were doing back then. And I'm sure there were some doing it, but they were the ones that weren't successful. The ones that tend to be successful, they tend to um, they tend to have been consistent with the successful coaches today. It's about treating people with a level of respect and dignity and all those other things we spoke about. The conditioning might be different, but the people we're talking about um, And I think, like, when I hear people talk about uh, millennials or things like that, I say, just be careful with this kind of thing. If you describe it when they were born, great, but don't use it as a way to stereotype or generalise because we all know that you wouldn't speak about people of a certain race or you wouldn't speak about people of a certain gender in those um, in those stereotypical tones because we know it's not acceptable. So be careful about doing the same thing when it comes to talking about generations as well because some of the principles that, are, that we have more in common than we have that divides us. Well, that, that, yeah, it's uh, something that I find very interesting with regards to, as you said, current behaviours. And I'd have to agree with you with regards to saying that people are still more or less the exact same. It's just that, as you rightfully said, they've just been conditioned ever so slightly differently, whether it's how they act or what they're used to. And one thing that I haven't touched on, but it, it pretty much ties into more or less everything we've talked about we're always talking about the elite level. We're talking about the top of the business, the top of the sports team, whether it's the management, whether it's the players, the culture within it. One thing that I have to deal with quite often, coaching 17, 18, 19, 20-year-olds, is you try and implement a lot of the things we've talked about up until now. But one of the outside influences that perhaps professional athletes don't have to deal with is parents. And it's a big topic within sports. And is there a way for a, a manage, manager, whether it's in a business or a sport, dealing with younger people who have parents that influence them that bit more, is there a way to basically create something that no matter what the parents will be saying, whether positive or negative, will not be able to feed into that person's mind, whether they're a cultural architect within the team or if they're just a bit part player within the team as well? Um. I think in terms of answering the question, if, if I've understood it correctly, Rich, is I think it's the idea that I, I often encourage, if you want to get a message across that isn't landing, is that the is that the nature of the question that you're asking about some people that just... To an extent, I'm just also talking about, say, parents' influence on schoolboys or schoolgirls in, say, a sports setting, if that makes sense. Yeah, of course. Well, I'd, I'd, I'd often say... So, so there's two answers that I, I feel are, are appropriate to that question. First of all, get away from outcome focus. So did you win or lose? If that's your first question, it encourages uh, this idea that that on on what can sometimes be unhelpful responses. So if I do, so whether they win or lose at a school one level or on school school child level, it's almost irrelevant. Did you enjoy it first of all? Should be a question. What did you learn? What did you do that that uh, that made you proud? A far more helpful questions to ask a child than whether they won or the, uh, lost the game or not. Simply because you're emphasising the idea of what they control rather than the outcome that might have been beyond them. They might have still played well. They might have still enjoyed it, even if they were routed in the game. So I think from parents' point of view, get away from this idea of win or lose because then that just reinforces that idea that of of uh, of win at all costs that can often uh, be destructive at that level. The second way is as well, give them things that are, that are elements of, of 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 balance 
the praise. So there's a ratio that is often advocated. Um, there's, re there's plenty of research on this. I'll happily send it on if anyone wants to get in touch having listened to it. But it's the idea of five to one is a ratio. So you don't have to just um, bombard them with positives or equally, you don't have to be too harsh in the criticism. It's the proportion that's, that's important. So they talk about five very loosely termed positive comments for every one negative comment. So you can identify that they tried hard, they did well, they enjoyed it. And then you can give them one area of feedback to say, there's one thing there that I thought you could have done better. And what we know is if you get your ratio right, the proportion right, and you've given them five things that you identified they did well or that reinforced what they were doing, they can then take the feedback from you to get better. But the ratio has to be there. So you can't just blow smoke up the backside and tell them they're amazing and then because uh, 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 that gives them a false uh, perception. But equally, you can't just hammer them and tell them what they didn't do. The ratio has to be there, and that's almost the magic number of five to one. Mm, no, that 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 pretty much covers what uh, what I was looking for, and that's quite an insightful five to one ratio with regards to the positive slash negative natures of your comments. Um, well, Damien, that that more or less concludes the podcast. But I traditionally like to finish finish off with a quick fire round. Cool, so cool. I'll ask a few <laughs> a few uh, quick fire questions. So just don't overthink, and whatever comes into the the brain, just shout it out. If you want so first one is what is the strangest thing you've seen while working with a professional sports team wow strangest thing um oh, uh I'm, I'm trying to think of any that uh that could be applied it was a team <laughs> that i worked with uh and again I'll, I'll i'll keep it as vague as that where one of the players yeah, yeah. used to enjoy helicoptering so when they celebrated uh a win he would he would get his cock and basically do the helicopter with it. And uh, <laughs> Sky <laughs> had cameras in the dressing room and he oh. was inadvertently <laughs> once caught helicoptering. So I wouldn't say it was strange, but it was certainly very, very amusing <laughs> when he realised that uh, oh. that his, um, his meat and two veg were being paraded in front of a, a horrified nation. <laughs> oh, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, next question, favourite day of the week? Uh, I don't really. Um, I, I, I genuinely don't have that, uh, Have a favourite day. I think it used to be Sundays because I just used to like getting up and, uh, and and reading the Sunday papers and that was a proper indulgence. And then um, my children came along, which meant that my focus shifted on that. So I'd say it's uh, Sunday morning, just out of a, uh, out of a legacy but. It's not about reading the papers now. It's very much around enjoying spending time with that. Which person do you admire most and why? Uh, I'm going to be biased there. I'm going to give my dad as the reference point for that. Uh, my, uh, I grew up in a sporting environment. So my dad was a boxing coach, uh, but his own story is, is fascinating. So he left school um, uh, as an illiterate 14 year old. So, he, so before that, he grew up as a as an illegitimate child. Uh, so he, he, his education was limited to, he was, he was um, illiterate when he left school at 14. And taught himself to read and write, he became a boxing coach, he became the first Manchester uh, man to train a world champion for over 80 years. When he, So he had a number of guys that went on to achieve a, a, a quite significant careers in boxing. And then he also wrote a number of books himself to raise funds for the boxing club that he ran. So, um, I mean, just as an outcome, Manchester named the road after him in the city last year to pay tribute to the impact that the work he'd done. So it wasn't about his sporting or his, or, or his literary achievements. I see now as his son uh, just the impact he had on thousands of people's lives where people will come over and credit him with having quite a significant impact just in terms of being a genuinely decent, humble, um, kind person. So I was lucky enough that he was my dad, but genuinely I think his, uh, what he achieved and the difference he made was pretty significant. Well, that's a, that's, a, that's a lovely story to hear and a lovely bit of backstory as well. What is the worst advice you see or hear being given in your world? Uh, man up. 
<laughs> man up, toughen up, get on with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just think, uh, and I'd, 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 I'd say with that, that I often hear that, <laughs> I've got a general rule of thumb that uh, whenever I hear anyone use the word banter, I've got a general rule of thumb that I've never heard yeah. anyone use that word banter that I wouldn't consider to be a bit of a dick. <laughs> and the reason I say that is, it's often bullying. It's often snide underhand. I'm not talking about having a laugh. That's different. Yeah. But when it's targeted, constant sniping at somebody, and then you excuse it as banter and the advice is, oh, man up, get on with it. I just think it's toxic and corrosive to a culture. Mm. Uh, what is your favorite film of all time? My favorite film is a beautiful, uh, it's an Italian film called uh, Life is Beautiful. There's a translation. Uh, it won the Oscar for the best film back in 1999. So it's a few years, it's 20 years old now. But it's, um, it's loose, it's very basically loose on, uh, Victor Frankl's story. Victor Frankl was a Holocaust survivor. So the story is that it's a guy that goes in, it gets captured and puts into Auschwitz and he goes in there with his young son and he basically creates this, uh, this illusion for his son that it's all just a game to protect him against the horrors of what's really happening around it. And uh, it sounds like an incongruous idea for a film, but it's actually so beautifully made that I'd defy anyone to watch it and not sort of be really incredibly moved by the story. Uh, yeah, I just love it. I think it's beautiful. Good choice. And last but not least, describe yourself in three words. <laughs> um Humble. Um, I genuinely uh, believe there's a level of humility. Uh, I don't. I. I. I, I don't think uh, too much of myself. Um, that's not that I think less of myself. I just don't think of myself so much. Mm. Um, I think I'm hardworking, uh, and I care. Well said. Maybe. Uh, maybe uh, Pep Guardiola might look into one or two of those characteristics, considering they seem to pop up a bit in his uh, regime yes. but that, that more or less concludes the podcast Damien and thanks a million for coming on and I'd like to congratulate you oh no it's an honour to be asked Richie I'm really grateful and I appreciate uh, appreciate you giving up the time uh, to invite us on and, and to, to ask such brilliant questions and then I mean, to give the space to so at least think and answer them mm. and I'll listen I'll make sure to leave a link attached with the podcast so anyone Anyone who's listening who's interested in buying any of your books, and as I've said, Damon, you've wrote several in-depth uh, books covering Sir Alex Ferguson's style of leadership to the latest one about the DNA of Barcelona's culture. Um, so anyone willing to look into that or even just learn about your work would be able to do so. So it's been a pleasure, oh, well, thank Damon. Thank you, that's really kind. I'm grateful. And um, thanks a million for chatting today, and I hope uh, the rest of your day is eventful. And, and yours as well. Great within itself. Thanks, mate. Um, but up. Oh,